Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk this morning on behalf of myself and Jane Roberts, who's a research fellow um, at the Open University. And we've been doing some research looking at uh, the dynamics of how police work with elected politicians. And so this paper is about um, police leadership at the political interface. So um, I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. So um, I guess the dilemmas for many uh, public managers and many uh, professionals in public services, um, particularly at the more senior level, uh, they have to work with organisations which are inherently political because public organisations are inherently political. And so they're more likely to be involved in uh, matters of debate and so on, both in formal terms and uh, informal terms. If you think about the, um, you know, the policing of um, but at the same time, although they're involved in uh, inherently political issues, they mustn't get too involved in politics, uh, particularly party politics, um, because in Westminster systems of government, it's different in presidential systems. Public servants are expected to be. Um, can you hear me OK? Something just went wrong then. Some disruptions are happening. So if you could repeat the last thing you said, that would be very helpful. OK, OK. Um, so in Westminster systems, which are different from presidential systems, uh, public managers and professionals uh, mustn't get involved in party politics. So this paper is about how do you navigate those um, tensions, particularly in the context of policing. Um, in earlier work uh, with Stella Manzi, we've used the metaphor for this where there's dual leadership at the top of an organisation, uh, the dancing on ice metaphor. So the idea that there are two people involved in leadership, a, um, a political leader and a, a professional leader who are operating on a very slippery surface in the spotlight. Um, and uh, so it is a form of dual leadership. Um, and in other work I've done, uh, looking at uh, public managers across three countries, when we've looked at how um, senior, senior professionals work with uh, politicians, we found not rigid roles uh, and the idea that there is a, a line between what a, a politician does and what a, a professional does, uh, which is what quite a lot of the literature would say should be happening, that there ought to be a line between politics and um, public service or, or public service delivery. Um, but instead, there's more like a zone. Uh, and so it's a negotiated space. So we wanted to look at this in relation to policing. Um, oh, so I'm going to skip that one, actually. That's about political skills, just saying that uh, yeah, I'm going to skip that one, actually, to say uh, our focus is very much on police leadership here. And policing is notably uh, political. You can't turn on the television and watch the news without some item or other about um, th the way that the police are working or the way that they failed victims or the fact that they've just are investigating a politician uh, or whatever. And we see lots of um, examples of that. And we've seen quite a lot um, uh, Black Lives Matter, the, um, the policing of the uh, coronavirus pandemic um, and so on. So it's in some ways it's at the sharp end of this whole area of um, the political uh, dynamics between professionals and elected politicians. And it's particularly important, I guess, because it's really important that there is scrutiny of the police and how they use their authority, which is conferred by the state. They're the only public service, I think, which is allowed to use co coercive force to the extent of lethal force against the citizens of their own state. And so it's really not that that happens every day. I don't mean that, but they can't. They are um, uh, warranted to be able to do that. 
And so it's important that there is scrutiny, including by, by politicians, but also by the media and others. On the other hand, there are occasions in which the police investigate and even arrest uh, politicians. So it really is at the sharp end. So we wanted to look at three research questions. Firstly, how do police officers and staff understand the roles of elected politicians? What do they think of them? How do they think about their roles uh, and so on? Secondly, how do they actually interact with elected politicians? What kind of relationships do they form and why and over what uh, purposes? And also thirdly, what is known about the skills and judgment or what I would call political astuteness, uh, how it's important, uh, whether or not it's important in effective working with senior police, uh, sorry, um, in senior policing, but working with um, uh, politicians. Um, and what does that political astuteness consist of? This draws on some of my earlier work about skills and judgment by um, public managers and the need to have skills which are, uh, help people to um, assess and work with diverse and sometimes competing interests across a range of different stakeholders. So uh, political astuteness can be very constructive. It's not automatically uh, Machiavellian, uh, although it could be, uh, could be either. So those are our research um, questions. And we looked at them uh, in the context of UK policing, where there's been considerable interest in the UK since 2012, when a new role was brought in for the police uh, to scrutinise the police, which is the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner. And this is a new, well, it's nearly 10 years old actually, but people still talk of it as, as relatively new, uh, a key element of uh, governance in England and Wales. So this doesn't apply to Scotland or Northern Ireland, and I'm conscious I'm talking about the UK for people who are outside the UK. So the idea is that for each of the 43 geographical police forces around England and Wales, there is a single elected police and crime commissioner whose role is to uh, oversee the police force and ensure the efficient and effective uh, use of resources in policing. I'll expand a bit more on that later. So there's been a lot of interest in the literature around this particular role, but we also wanted to look at um, the dynamics of police working with a much wider set of politicians uh, as they do. So that includes local councillors, it includes members of parliament and ministers, and obviously the Home Secretary, um, we wanted to look at devolved administration uh, as, as well. Our focus is only England and Wales, but we're conscious that there are um, uh, elected politicians in um, Scotland and, sorry, devolved politicians in Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland. And also in some areas of the UK now, there are what are called metro mayors who've been elected for particular city regions. Some of you may be familiar with Andy Burnham for Manchester, um, for example. So our focus is on working with all politicians, not just police and crime commissioners. However, this morning, I'm mainly going to talk about the police and crime commissioners as it happens and their working relationships with um, senior police. The research we've done so far, there's two components to it. So one is we've done a literature review, and the second is that we've uh, interviewed uh, a number of people, and I'll come to that in a moment. <clears throat> when we looked at the literature, we did a systematic um, academic literature review. We looked at um, what is known about police working with politicians, uh, governance, uh, roles, relationships and skills. Um, and what we found is that the literature is overly focused on police and crime commissioners. And um, th so there's a lot about, um, you know, the, the governance arrangements now compared with when there were um, police authorities, 
um, the pros and cons of having police and crime commissioners, uh, what they're actually doing, what the regulations say, what the policing protocol says, and so on. So it very much tends to focus on the formal aspects of governance more than an understanding of how roles are negotiated to the extent that they are, and very little on how <coughs> roles, uh, relationships are, are created, developed, uh, go sour, uh, improve, uh, and so on. Uh, and we didn't find any literature at all on uh, how to develop uh, leadership with political astuteness specifically for the police. So how do police acquire the skills and the judgment and the knowledge about how to work with elected politicians in a way that is both professional um, and ethical, uh, but also effective? So we've done a paper on this and it's available. I'm happy to share it with anybody. Uh, we haven't yet published it, so we're really interested in any comments that um, people might have on that. Mm. Right, my, okay, I'm going to do it that way. There we are. So in the field work, what we've done so far is we've interviewed 11 peace, police and crime commissioners from around the UK. We chose them to be uh, Labour, uh, Conservative and also independent, although the, since the last elections there's, there's very few, uh, actually there's no independence, so that's quite interesting. So we interviewed these people before the May elections uh, during this year. We also interviewed their counterpart, chief constables. So in our interviews, we've got some comments from the PCCs on their chief constables and vice versa. And we also ran two workshops with superintendents and chief superintendents who are the level in policing who are just about, well, who may move up in their next promotion to the executive team. So we call them aspiring senior um, police. Just so happens that there's 11, um, we actually invited more, but on the day, uh, operational matters meant that 11 turned up. So it's pure coincidence that it's 11, 11, 11. We've got further research ongoing uh, with um, uh, other police, <clears throat> and also um, we're just about to interview um, uh, local authority chief executives as a, uh, and other politicians. So today I'm going to talk about work in progress and I can't use detailed data yet because uh, we haven't uh, cleared some of our quotations and so on and ensured that they don't uh, reveal accidentally who said what. But I can tell you we've had some really, really rich um, interviews and some really candid views on both sides. Um, so yeah, just need to do more analysis and uh, clear the interviews. But let me give you some sense of the themes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context and formal governance arrangements, a bit about roles, a little bit about relationships, which is uh, roles and relationships, I think, are particularly interesting, and also skills, attitudes and behaviours. So uh, very briefly then, uh, in terms of the context and formal governance, um, uh, a, a number of people talked about the changing nature of policing, um, uh, uh, particularly around changing nature of crime, the impact of the pandemic, um, uh, uh, the changing nature of uh, society and so on. And um, People also talked about the uh, the act which introduced police and crime commissioners, um, of which there's quite a lot of interest from academics, but the public seem to be largely indifferent about. And in fact, um, the elections for police and crime commissioners have had a very, very low um, turnout. There was a lot of discussion about um, uh, the uh, operational independence of chief constables and the policing protocol. And the policing protocol sets out um, uh, what are the responsibilities of the PCC and what are the responsibilities of a chief constable. 
But in fact, although they're set out in black and white in the protocol, uh, people like Tom Windsor, the uh, chief inspector for um, police, has noted how fuzzy and how ambiguous um, it is. The protocol was introduced in order to safeguard operational independence of chief constables, um, but it doesn't really seem to be doing that job. Uh, the COVID pandemic, we, we did the interviews during the pandemic. Uh, they were all done online, but we were really surprised and pleased at how candid uh, people were. It has thrown police and politicians together much more and chief constables, a number of them talked about um, their, during the pandemic, they kind of systematized much more their relationships, particularly with MPs and with um, councillors. When we come to roles um, and how they are negotiated, uh, the, the chief constables uh, were very clear that they accepted uh, and indeed um, really embraced the idea of uh, democratic sc scrutiny. They thought that was really important, but they were, most of them were very, very critical of the actual form of governance, which is located in a single individual, um, being the police and crime commissioner. And what we found is a huge, um, most were really skeptical about the PCC model while they didn't necessarily want to go back to police authorities, they did feel that there was perhaps a middle ground between um, having to relate to a single individual with all the vagaries and um, uh, variation, I suppose, due to personality, interests and so on. They um, had established working relationships on a one-to-one -one basis with very, very different PCCs who had different views about what a PCC role was, what the PCC should be doing, how they should be working and so on. Uh, so PCCs were highly variable and uh, many of the chiefs um, uh, consequently had um, had to negotiate their role in, in very different ways. Some took a very formal approach um, keeping their PCC at quite a distance. Oh, are you coming on to say I don't have very long? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and others Sorry. really appreciated um, working with their with their PCC, and it seemed to relate quite a lot to how much experience that PCC had. Uh, I'm going to move on quite quickly then. Um, uh, the importance of the relationships uh, forged. Um, uh, there were a wide, wide range of relationships with PCCs. Uh, so although the legislation talks in, a, in a, a formal term about what it should be, there were some chiefs who, who really kept their PCCs at a distance, only had formal meetings, shut them out of lots of things. Um, others who had quite a, a warm and close relationship, um, although always um, uh, the, the need to um, not not so much get close as to be attuned, uh, that was uh, seemed to be quite important. And there were others who had uh, PCCs they experienced as a bit of a nightmare, uh, and who actually had to spend a huge amount of time uh, briefing keeping up to date, trying to predict what the PCC was going to do so that there wasn't too much interference in operational uh, matters. Um, right. Uh, and so this required quite a lot of political astuteness by the police. We've got quite a lot on um, the skills and um, uh, behaviours. Uh, and I'll perhaps leave that for another time. So really, just to conclude, seeing politics as part and parcel of policing at both operational and strategic levels, but most of the literature seems to have focused too much just on PCCs and too much on formal governance rather than how these roles are negotiated. In other words, not really seeing them as leadership roles, as simply governance roles. Uh, the literature is overly focused on PCCs. I've kind of this morning uh, reflected that 
uh, although we have a lot of other data as well. Um, and I think um, so. I think what we're seeing is that there is much more negotiation. It's much more a zone than a, a line. Um, and also that uh, political skills and judgment um, are important. And the police talked about that um, a lot. I think this is also very timely research. There's many concerns about the current governance arrangements for police. Uh, a lot of critique of the current um, uh, governance, formal governance arrangements. Um, and there's a lot that can be learnt um, from this work. And in addition, just putting it into a different context, the government, the current government is contemplating at the moment the idea of um, establishing county mayors in a reorganisation of local government. Uh, and the idea of a single person as the governance body, I think Jane and I would want to argue is highly problematic. Um, it can work, but it can also go very badly wrong. Uh, and so I suppose we would want to argue on the formal governance side, a need for um, a, a different set of governance arrangements, but also much more attention to roles, relationships, skills and judgment. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you James. James. Brilliant, Brilliant presentation. Uh, do we have any questions, please, to be asked here? We have just a couple of minutes, unfortunately because of these technical difficulties. No questions in the chat. No one's raising hands now. OK, so it may give me a chance to ask the question. Oh, sorry. No, uh, Charles, Charles, go on, please. No, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, it was very, very interesting, extremely interesting. Just uh, basic and uh, na naive question because I'm not a an expert in this field. Were there discussions uh, or or uh, was there some emerging around issues of um, social movements and demands from, let's say, uh, society? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. And there was quite a lot of discussion of um, social movements, particularly in relation to the pandemic, um, Black Lives Matter, and also uh, violence against women and, and girls. So uh, yes, that came up in, I, I can't give too much detail because I can't yet talk about particular localities, but yes, it came up. And an important part, obviously, uh, in a way, the, the triangle is politicians, police and public. Uh, is the is you know uh, an important um, part of the landscape? Great, thanks. And Keith is asking a question in the chat, um, asking any thoughts on how your research, Jean, reflects on the refusal of the Met Police to investigate the government's eco Christmas parties last year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that illustrates, doesn't it? You know the. Um, uh, the fact that police are at the sharp end of uh, various um, political judgments. Interestingly, um, in our research, we decided not to include the Met Police uh, because they are involved in um, so many kind of global and national issues and their governance arrangements are slightly different anyway uh, through the Mayor of London and so on and, and MOPAC. Um, that we're, I'm afraid we sidestepped the Met, although who knows, perhaps we should um, include them in a uh, later phase of work. We have included other large forces, but but because the Met is um, a global city police force, we, we sidestepped that. So uh, watch this space, I guess, really, as to what's going to happen about those Christmas parties. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And I would ask uh, one last question, really brief one. You've mentioned this, uh, the the changing relationships within the crisis of uh, the, within the pandemic. So they become more systematic and they become more developed. Me personally, I'm coming from a Russian background and I see a lot of the systematic relationship, which is working against the, the population, literally against the society. So uh, is there any accountability to this, uh, to the, to this relationships which are emerging 
working and becoming you know more uh, close in a way. And uh, are there any instruments of the uh, of the of the societal control maybe which 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 have emerged within your research which you get a chance to see? Yeah, well, I suppose the the the, the so-called new model of PCCs is the PCC is meant to be operating uh, as the voice of the people uh, for a particular locality. Um, and so a number of them do talk about, um, you know, uh, acting on behalf of the public, uh, making sure that victims' voices are heard, that particular issues in a locality are are heard. So uh, to that extent, um, there is a degree of accountability. However, as I mentioned, the turnout rate uh, can be very, very low. Um, for example, 8% of the population turning out to vote for a, a, a PCC. Um, most people don't really understand uh, what PCCs do or can name their their local um, PCC. Actually, I don't think I could even name mine and I'm doing research on this. So this is interesting, isn't it? Uh, no, I do know. Actually, I do know. Um, but I think the difficulty is this governance arrangement is through a single individual. And I mean, uh, well, I guess this is a, a recorded session, so I need to be careful what I say, but um, uh, there were some very surprising views among some of the PCCs that we uh, interviewed about what about what their role was. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your research today, Jean. And unfortunately, we're quite short on time and it's time to move yeah. on to the next speaker later.